hello there, good evening, and welcome to uh, this Zoom uh, event uh, from the New Republic called The Soul of Our Politics. Very happy to be here, very happy you could join us. I'm Michael Tomaski, I'm the editor of the New Republic, the relatively new editor of the New Republic. I think it's my sixth week on the job, and this is my first one of these, and I'm very happy to be here and very grateful to our three panelists, uh, terrific panelists, uh, who are going to discuss uh, uh, religion in politics today, different aspects of it. And um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to introduce the panelists first, and uh, then I'll ask each a question and give them three or four or five minutes to, to say their piece, and then we'll just let it roll from there and, uh, and have an exchange. And then we'll bring in your questions toward the end uh, uh, of the hour. It's a one-hour event. And um, <clears throat> let's get going. Uh, Matthew Sitman is the associate editor of Commonweal and the co-host of the podcast, Know Your Enemy. He writes frequently for Dissent, where he also serves on the editorial board. Uh, I used to go to Dissent or editorial board meetings when I lived in New York. Um, Matthew is the only one of the three who actually had a piece in the issue. This was the May issue of the magazine. The cover line was the soul of our politics. Uh, and so uh, we'll probably go to him first uh, for that reason. Uh, Andra Gillespie is Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference at Emory University. And she is the author of several books, most recently, Race and the Obama Administration, Symbols, Substance, and Hope. That came out in 2019. Andra, thank you for joining us. And finally, uh, Peter Weiner. Uh, Peter is an American writer and a former speech writer for the administrations of three United States presidents. And he is the vice president and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a conservative think tank in Washington and a fellow at the Trinity Forum, a nonprofit Christian organization. Uh, welcome to you all and thanks to you all. Uh, so Matthew, let me start with you. So your piece in the May issue of the New Republic, which was headlined, let's go look it out, Change You Can Believe In, uh, was uh, about uh, attempts to revive a progressive religious left uh, mm -hmm. and, and your assessment of, of where that stands. So let me just ask you, uh, we have a president, Joe Biden. He's, to me, he's the most openly religious Democratic president in a long, long time, I think since Jimmy Carter probably, uh, goes to mass every, I think usually on Saturdays rather than Sundays, but goes pretty much every week uh, from what I see from the emails from his uh, uh, press pool that, that follows him around. Uh, speaks scripturally a lot, I think, uh, invokes Catholic values uh, pretty, pretty openly. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, right, because he's in a party that has become increasingly secular uh, and, and, and that is very religiously diverse. Uh, so is there a tension there that, that's, that's a, a thing that the Democratic Party has to, like, wrestle with? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I would, well, as you know, writers don't pick their headlines. So um, change you can believe, and I might have added a question mark at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, because I think it is an open question. Um, but I would add that Biden is not just, uh, you know, the most openly religious Democratic nominee and president since Jimmy Carter. He, he's a very distinctly Catholic president. Yes. Right. Um, my, my friend Massimo Fajoli, who's a theologian at uh, Villanova University, who I cite in my piece, said that uh, you know, Biden's the first uh, president to, Catholic, to publicly express a Catholic soul. And I think what he meant was that Biden wears it on his sleeve and he didn't have to do what John F. Kennedy did, right? Go down to Texas yeah. and assure those Baptist ministers that he wasn't gonna be taking orders from the Vatican. Um, and I, I mentioned that because I do think, um, as you uh, reminded viewers, Michael, and two of the main points I make in my piece is that um, any discussion of the religious left or how Biden's own faith might you know, influence his administration and his public policy uh, what kind of what place it has in the Democratic Party? Uh, that's taking place against the backdrop of religious disaffiliation, which is you know happening more strongly among progressive-minded people. 
Um, so it's more of an issue for Democrats. And the religious left is just much more diverse than the religious right. They're not parallel or equivalent terms, or they're not describing parallel or, or, or similar phenomenon. Uh, so I think um, it is, to me, it's an interesting uh, issue in that, you know, I think as a country, we're going to need to talk across different divides, you know, people from different backgrounds and traditions kind of carrying their moral language into our politics. And so to just one point, I think it is a problem or a, a something to be worked through as you're suggesting, but I think it actually is reflective of something I think more generally in our politics we'll have to uh, deal with. And the last point before I, you know, because um, we'll talk about all this as we go along, I would just say that I'm sort of confident that, um, you know, we, we should think about religion and politics less as like religion being this thing that contaminates an otherwise pure and pristine public sphere or that religious rhetoric or language is uniquely divisive uh, or kind of devoid of reason. I don't believe that because uh, after Biden passed the American Recovery Plan, uh, the National Catholic Reporter uh, editorialized saying this was Catholic social thought in action, yeah. right? And I think you can, Biden sometimes uses that language given his background. Right. Um, Others might use that language, but of course you could support the American recovery plan for all kinds of reasons. So I'm sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, to borrow from John Rawls, I believe in an overlapping consensus and that people can, you know, come to agree on things for different reasons sometimes. And that even the reasons we give if drawn from a particular tradition aren't necessarily out of bounds and they don't, uh, are not necessarily totally unintelligible to people from uh, a background of a different faith or no faith at all. Yeah, let me just follow up with you real quickly. Sure. Uh, just, just tell people uh, watching us, what is the religious left? I mean, everybody knows sure. what the religious right is and, and can name half a dozen leaders of it. Uh -huh. Nobody can name any leaders of the religious, religious left, I don't think. So what is it? Well, um, it's a, that's actually one of the kind of recurring arguments about those of us you know, journalists on the religion beat, people who engage this topic, they say, oh, the religious left doesn't, strictly speaking, even exist. Yeah. I don't take that view. It's just much more diverse and diffuse than the religious right. And it's much more of a patchwork of, you know, some local activists. There are some national, you know, groups, people like Reverend Barber, the Moral uh, Mondays. You know, I think, you know, he's a increasingly well-known and people point to him a lot, but there are, you know, um, uh, sanctuary churches in Arizona that you probably haven't heard of. And uh, so I, I think the religious left does exist. If you ask me what it is, it's, it's hard to actually label in a way. Um, it's best uh, encountered by describing the breadth of uh, people of faith uh, with progressive commitments politically that are doing work all across the country. And sometimes that might mean it's Catholic nuns in Washington, you know, lobbying to get the ACA uh, across the finish line. But it could also mean a pastor in Arizona you've never heard of uh, mm -hmm. trying to you know, help uh, un undocumented uh, migrants. Yeah. So there's, it's not an easy answer, or there, it can't be answered, I think, that easily. But I do think it exists, and it's marked by diversity and uh, um, a sort of less hierarchical, top-down um, point to just a few leaders and you sort of get a sense of it. You can't do that with the religious left. Right. Interesting. Uh, Andra Gillespie, let's turn to you. Um, unmute yourself there. Thank you. Uh, so um, let me ask you about uh, the Black church uh, and its its um, role and condition today, if, if, it, if it's even that monolithic, or maybe it's not. Uh, but, you know, I see as someone who's obviously outside the black church, but but liberal in in, po in my politics, uh, you know, I see a, a continuity from, say, from 70 years ago, from Dr. King, indeed, to the pastor at his church who just became a United States senator, which is kind of a remarkable story in and of itself. But uh, is that continuity? Uh, uh, is it is it really that stable a story, or or are there has, has the black church, has its role and its conception of itself uh, and its role in politics changed in recent times? Yeah, well, thank you uh, for having me tonight. I mean, I think the one thing that I would say is, as a scholar of African-American politics, broadly speaking, is that while we spend a lot of time talking in generalities and talking about the commonalities 
and talking about the common threads, one of the things we also do want to talk about are the ways that Black communities are heterogeneous and how preferences are diverse um, within these communities, even if you kind of end up at the same end point um, or a very similar or common end point. And so we spend a lot of time talking about the ways that Blacks view their fates as being linked with other Blacks, and that lends itself to Blacks voting 90% plus Democratic and looking like they have very similar preferences on issues, but that actually belies that there's a lot of diversity kind of below the surface. The reason why historically we have focused on churches is because that was the first independent social organization within Black communities. And so where you saw Blacks gathering as slaves uh, to worship God and to uh, support themselves as they fought for freedom or withstood the adversities of slavery to organizing um, you know, um, after slavery. I mean, organizing during the civil rights movement, this was an institution that Blacks controlled. Um, and it's not surprising that we saw leadership emerge from this particular institution that you know helped to create the black freedom struggle and provided key personnel who because of their independence were able to say and do things that many people weren't able to do uh, for economic reasons if they were tied down to a job that they would be more likely to lose as a result of it so um you know that's still very much a part um, of african-american history and african-american social movements but there was diversity in the mid-20th century and there's still diversity today. So you couldn't, if you wanted to create a mass social movement amongst African Americans in the United States today, just go to black Protestant churches and expect that you're going to cover, uh, you know, most blacks. Um, you know, we do see while blacks are still more uh, religious in terms of their profession of faith, but also even in terms of their practice. Um, you know, we do see increased secularization uh, within African American communities. So we see fewer people subscribing uh, to Christianity um, and other religious Religions, we see sort of a higher incidence of people not subscribing to faith at all within these communities. So, you know, it's important for us to recognize that religious diversity within African American communities. And yet still, this is a really important cultural force. And so, yeah, while there are through lines from Dr. King to Senator Warnock, for instance, it's also important to recognize what that looked like, because that jumps over a whole lot of steps. And so we could go from, you know, Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and the SCLC and talk about about African-American ministers who served in office before. So we could talk about people like Adam Clayton Powell who preceded them. Um, and then also talk about, you know, more modern ministers turned politicians like Andrew Young, like Floyd Flake and Calvin Butts. So Raphael Warnock is definitely following in, um, you know, a very sort of, you know, longstanding tradition. And alongside you have people who are more progressive in faith but also hold order nation like Corey, uh, Congresswoman Cory Bush from Missouri. And then you also have your technocrats, like the ones that I typically study in my research, like, you know, lawyers like Senator Cory Booker, for instance, or Vice President Harris, and they're all part of that. Um, all part of that tradition, but they're all touching on different parts of it. And so there is, you know, a certain common cultural lexicon that is by necessity diversifying because African American communities um, are, are diversifying. And so there are religious and secular and not even Christian and non Christian elements within these communities. And so you if you're going to sort of organize a movement, you have to talk to all of them. Um, and you have to make sure that you're including all of those voices in the, at the table. Is there much of a um... Uh, generational divide uh, today uh, uh, among African Americans generally, and just with re within the church and with respect to religion. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just thinking that um, you know, j this is just anecdotal, but uh, it seemed that younger Black voters in the last couple of elections turned a little bit more towards Sanders, uh, uh, whereas older Black voters certainly were very strong for Biden. Uh, is that reflecting something that's that's real, or or is is that just a question of political preference and and not very deep? Well, I mean, so generational divisions are longstanding within African American communities. I think sometimes we forget that you know Dr. King was a rabble rouser when he was suggesting boycotts, right? right? And there were older members, older leaders within the African American community who were offering a more incremental, more measured approach. And King was being radical by suggesting going out and marching. Um, and so, you know, there have been fights. Uh, I live in Atlanta, and so you know, Andrew Young had it out with Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, uh, during the early days of 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 the organization of, of the movement for Black Lives, um, and you know had some uh, very harsh words for these younger activists, um, and so I think it's just important for us to realize.
realize that these things are cyclical. And so the rabble rousers of one generation are the establishment of another generation. And that's also going to manifest itself in terms of, you know, what people's preferences are, what their foci is going to be, um, and what their strategy is going to be. And so we certainly see generational differences. So we see generational differences in terms of sort of, you know, what leadership looks like. So, uh, you know, Black Lives Matters repudiation of sort of the centralized leadership with figureheads uh, and in terms of something that's more leaderful, we see greater intentionality amongst younger um, activists to be more intersectional, to be more inclusive, right? They are responding to what they learned about the civil rights movement and the mistakes in terms of silencing the voices of women and LGBTQ people. Um, and so we see differences and we see innovations, uh, but yet everybody is agreed or most people are agreed, you know, on sort of the struggle. And, you know, in this moment that Black shouldn't be over-policed and killed, that there are systemic inequalities that need to be addressed. And there's a certain level of impatience amongst younger people who realize because they've been taught this, that people have been fighting for this, uh, you know, for, you know, whether it was in slavery or during the post reconstruction era or during the middle part of the 20th century for, you know, over a century. Um, and they're still trying to figure out, okay, what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And they just want to push that ball forward. And collectively, I think that that is what the sort of larger struggle of civil rights is going to be, is that there are periods of setback, but there are also periods of progress where young people are usually leading the way to create a much more expansive and much more equitable vi vision of what America is. Great, thanks. Uh, Pete Weiner, uh, thank you also for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, you know, the first question for you is, is the inevitable one, which which I see you asked on, on television from time to time. Uh, and there's, I guess, no reason, no way we can avoid asking it here. Uh, you've been very critical uh, of Donald Trump and the way conservative religious leaders uh, uh, blindly embraced him. Um, is there any sense, Trump's out of office now five months, uh, I don't suppose there's any sense that anything has changed on that front in these last four or five months, is there? Not really. Uh, first, Michael, thanks for, for hosting this and uh, Kim and the others for, for organizing it. And it's a pleasure to be on with uh, with the other folks here. Um, I'd say yes and no. Uh, uh, I'm guessing that for the evangelical Christian world, that particular subculture, um, same thing is happening to them that is happening Republicans more generally which is that they're identifying with Trump uh, personally less. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not an insignificant trend, but they are identifying um, with the conspiracy theories and the anti-democratic impulses that have been associated with Trump uh, as much now or even more than in the past. That to me is, is, is a worrisome sign because it means that those impulses are becoming a key to both I would say Republican and evangelical identity independent of, of, uh, of Trump. Uh, so uh, um, that I think is where the, 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 the so-called religious right evangelical world is. I think the trajectories that have been, um, the things that have been catalyzed, the trajectory of the movement, which I've been quite critical of, have continued and worsened. There, there was an interesting study uh, by the Conservative American Enterprise Institute earlier this year uh, on evangelicals, and it found that uh, more than a quarter believed fully or largely with some of the QAnon conspiracy theories, especially this idea that Hollywood figures and Democrats are leading a pedophile ring. It's obviously a ludicrous and insane conspiracy theory, but a lot of people believe in it. And Daniel Cox, who conducted the survey, said that um, by a significant margin, evangelicals um, embrace two things. One is um, conspiracy theories, and the other is a disposition to think that political violence may be necessary um, at, at some point. So I think that these things um, are, that, that have been catalyzed are dangerous. A lot of us were warning about them before, and I just feel like this idea that once Trump left the scene, things would snap back, so to speak, to normal was not realistic. Those poisons have been unleashed and they're not, uh, they're not gonna be drained anytime soon. Let's go back to 2015 and 2016. Right. Um, what exactly was the appeal there? I mean, it, because it, unless I'm misremembering, a number of them signed on with him 
a little bit before it was obviously apparent that he was going to be the nominee or or yeah no that's yeah it was it was a somewhat complicated picture but it was certainly a a, a discouraging and revealing one i would i would say just on yeah. what happened on 2015 um that you know there it was it was split uh the the fair amount of evangelicals were for ted cruz mike huckabee was in in the race just to pull the lens back a little bit i i would say that there were 16 other figures in the race in 2016 in the GOP primary. Right. And they were pretty impressive figures. And there was pretty much any flavor of ice cream you wanted. If you wanted a libertarian, there was Rand Paul. If you liked a certain kind of right wing social conservative, there was Rick Santorum or Huckabee or Cruz. If you were more of a reform conservative, there was Rubio or Christie or Jeb Bush. So it wasn't as if there weren't a lack of choices. So in comes Donald Trump, no real history with the Republican Party had supported liberal causes, um, you know, throughout his, his life, including partial birth abortion, which is a pretty important issue to a lot of evangelicals. And he came in and I, I still remember when, when um, the Super Tuesday happened, um, he got 42% of the, of the white evangelical vote in Alabama and did extremely well through a number of states. <laughs> Um, and so, so they, it wasn't as if a majority went with him, but far too many, given his history and given what evangelicals for their entire lives, political lives, had talked about. So what was it, the, the question is, what was the appeal? What was it about Donald Trump that brought them in since by any other metric that ever mattered to either evangelicals or Republicans for that matter, uh, he, wouldn't, he would have been you know, 100th on a list of 16. And I think one of the answers was that he tapped into a culture which was spreading, a culture of victimization, of resentment, of grievances, and a lot of fear. Um, I disagree with this, but I will look, give you my sense of where the lot of evangelicals are coming from. There is an almost existential fear if you talk to them um, about, about the left and about the state of American culture. Um, and they know that they're in retreat and they um, are worried that, that, that uh, the country, uh, as we know it, is going to end, that there's a threat to them and to their children. And they saw, I heard this all really frequently in my conversations with pro-Trump people during the 2016 campaign, which was he was a fighter. Um, that is, they, they wouldn't point to his character and say, that's what I would want my child to, to, to resemble. There was a sense that he was a person who would fight with a ferocity that other Republicans in their mind didn't, and that he understood, Trump did, the nature of the threat. Um, and that energized them and eventually won them, um, won them over. So there are other factors that, that, that are at play there, but I think that notion that he would be their protector um, was, was um, one of the things that was uh, really, really drove that, that association, which, is obviously an odd one to uh, to say the least. Yeah, uh, I want to bring Matthew and Andre in on this question of of, of Trump and and uh, conservative religious leaders. What you know, what what are your thoughts on on that matter? Start with uh, Matthew. Um, well, it's my my sense is that um, I mean I grew up. Um, I'm Catholic now and uh, on the left now, but I grew up a conservative Christian um, in central Pennsylvania. It, uh, it, it was a fundamentalist church. That's not my pejorative. That's uh, how they would describe themselves. Um, uh, independent, fundamental Bible believing would be the term. So I have family members who voted for Trump. I have some sense of, I think, the way he activated them in a way no candidate ever has before. Where I grew up in central Pennsylvania, I never saw so many signs. Um, and it also mattered that Trump showed up to the Altoona Convention Center and said they'd been, everyone there had been ripped off. Um, I hadn't really heard that language in quite the same way for a Republican candidate that kind of met, you know, um, uh, the, I mean, I grew, spent the 90s growing up hearing my dad complain about NAFTA, right? <laughs> and there Trump showed up. So I, I think, you know, some of his messaging actually was at work, but I think the deeper truth and the most fundamental point I want to make is, to me, uh, the Republican Party had become very good about um, a, a kind of touching on certain issues without crossing a line into outright bigotry or demagoguery. Close, right? Um, it's the Lee Atwater line, if you will. Yeah. Um, and I think Trump gave them the good stuff. 
uh, you know, uh, he dropped the euphemism, said the quiet part out loud and gave them just the raw kind of uh, all the things that have been just below the surface, sometimes not even below the surface, but just below the surface in the Republican Party for a long time. Um, Trump just came out with it in unfiltered, uncut. And once you get the good stuff, you're not going back to, uh, uh, you know, the fake cheap uh, alternatives. Yeah. Andra, is that roughly your assessment? I think that that's an interesting way of putting it. And so I think that <coughs> to add to this discussion is the concept of racial resentment um, and uh, how that is a strong predictor um, of vote choice. And, you know, and the, the thing that I will say, and I, I will disclose that I am a, an evangelical practicing evangelical. I grew up in a Bible believing church. It was a black one. Um, so, you know, where I grew up, fundamentalist meant you weren't charismatic. Um, and so I kind of <laughs> straddled those camps. Um, now in terms of, of, of my theology, but I mean, it's pretty orthodox and it's pretty conservative. And um, the thing that we don't think about is that we think that faith is informing political beliefs and behavior. Work by my friend Michelle Margolis at the University of Pennsylvania might suggest that this is actually more of a recursive relationship uh, and where uh, identities are informing each other. Um, and so it's important for us to, 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 to kind of keep that in mind is that, uh, you know, what some people might be claiming is, is Christianity is really the pattern of whatever it was you already thought. Um, and then you tried to wrap Jesus around it. And I think that that's the way that in some ways evangelical, white evangelical in particular, um, theology is kind of, you know, being pointed out where the sort of inconsistencies and hypocrisies are being pointed out. But in particular, you know, what Trump did, which surprised a lot of people, was that by starting his campaign out by maligning Mexicans, um, most people thought that that would eventually shut things down because we were in the post-civil rights era. In the post-civil rights era, it's impolite to say overtly racist things. People will discount that and they won't take you seriously um, as a candidate. And so Donald Trump completely challenged that. He does so, and I think we're still gonna have to think about this, uh, you know, and why this is the case. He might've been able to leverage his celebrity to be able to get away with being able to say the quiet parts out loud in ways that other people people aren't able to, I think the true test of this is going to be to see the longevity of voices like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates when Trump is off the scene, um, because they're not coming in famous or they weren't, you know, when they kind of took the, the stage and started to say outrageous things and we might have less tolerance. I don't know this yet, but we might have less tolerance for them because those are regular people and not folks, you know, who had a top 20 television show um, for, you know, a number of years or, or best-selling books before they became president. Um, and so there's that part of it. Uh, there is the part uh, that the Republican Party hadn't dealt with kind of going into the 2016 cycle um, about what role racial resentment actually played in its recruiting strategies. Uh, you know, we saw Ken Melman take some ownership of the Southern strategy and genuflecting to, to, to racial resentment starting in the late 1960s. And Donald Trump just amplified that um, a lot more. And, 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 and we have to reckon within the church with the fact that, uh, you know, that, that evangelicals, particularly white evangelicals, um, on standard uh, political psychological measures of, of, of racism tend to score higher on those measures. Uh, they tend to have a hard time understanding um, or accepting a systemic racism. Um, and, uh, you know, these things can then be exploited and have been exploited, not just by Donald Trump. They've been exploited, you know, going back to the early 1970s. Um, if we take the work by people like Todd Shields and Angie Maxwell and, 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 and Robbie Jones series, um, in order to draw people into the Republican Party. And so some of it, you know, was racism. Some of it was Christian nationalism. Some of it was anti-feminist. Um, and all of these things kind of came together in the person of Donald Trump, who was willing to say anything. And then if you put that in an environment that is hyper polarized, where people have sorted, where we don't have liberal Republicans, we don't have conservative Democrats anymore, um, and where we have what my colleague Alan Abramowitz refers to as negative partisanship. So the idea that we identify ourselves politically by what we aren't. And if you are already primed, like if you grew up as I did in the 90s, listening to the old time gospel hour or watching it on TV with Jerry Falwell and seeing basically anti-Clinton stuff for years um, on there instead of sermons as I got ready for church in the morning, right? You've been taught the Democratic Party is bad, the Democratic Party is bad, the Democratic Party is bad. And so even though you're being given this very flawed <coughs> nominee in the, uh, you know, in the name of Donald Trump, 
he is being presented as probably the best hope to beat whoever is going to be the Democratic nominee. And so you accept that for strategic purposes, thus evidencing a certain lack of faith that I think is important for us to discuss. Um, and, uh, and, and you're willing to go along with it and make that Faustian bargain that has erupted and now gotten completely out of control. Uh, it looks like we lost Matthew Sittman. He had uh, internet issues uh, at about 10 minutes till the hour before we all, uh, before we started the webinar. So I anticipate we'll get him back here in a minute. Uh, so Pete, let me ask you, let's move away from Trump. Right. And uh, I want to ask you about a very interesting thing you said in, in your first set of remarks. Uh -huh. um, is there something in the evangelical uh, worldview uh -huh. that makes them, many of them, um, uh, amenable to an anti-democratic, small d, of course, an anti-democratic worldview? Is democracy not particularly a high value to these leaders? Yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair question to ask, given, given our present moment. Um, I, you know, I'd have to explore the, the data in depth to give a, a, a answer I'm confident in. My, my intuition is not generally speaking. I, I do think, I think Anders said something that was important, um, which is um, it, the, the way I would put it, um, and what's really been reinforced to, to me over, over these last uh, you know, half decade or so, is the degree to which faith is subordinated to politics. I think if you talk to most people, honest people who are of the Christian faith, evangelicals, um, they believe that they are interpreting these issues through a faithful lens. I think they're wrong on that, but, but I don't think they're being cynical um, about it. And I think this has to do with, with human psychology. I think we all struggle with these in various ways, but the degree to which faith has been subordinated in sort of proof text, the Bible's proof text to, to reinforce these, 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 these views and, and the justification is, is, is extremely important. In my experience, I haven't sensed that, that uh, you know, evangelicals in particular have been anti-democratic in their, in, their, uh, in their impulses. It's a world I'm pretty familiar with. I've spent most of my life as a person of the Christian faith within the evangelical world. Um, I think what has happened um, is that they, they gain this attachment to Trump for all sorts of reasons, some of which we've discussed here. And once that attachment was made, and some of it, quite honestly, was reluctant. I mean, if you talk to some evangelicals 2015 or 2016, I know I've had these conversations with people, they weren't huge Trump supporters. They really came on board um, once it became, you know, Clinton versus versus Trump, but there was none of us lives well with cognitive dissonance. There was obviously a cognitive dissonance for what evangelicals said they believed for most of their life in Trump. So they had to 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 make peace with that, and the way they did that is they they um, mitigated the the corruptions of Donald Trump and elevated the threats of other people um, to try and make them live more peacefully with, with their choice. But once they made that connection, once they cast their hat over the wall with Trump, then the political tribalism took over, this affective polarization that Andre was talking about. And as he became more anti-democratic, I think they became more anti-democratic. That's certainly not a justification for it. It's as, as I've been banging the pots and pans for a long time now, so they have to stand up for it. But I'm not sure that I would say that, that there was a sort of anti-democratic impulse in the modern evangelical um, movement. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, let's go back to talking about the left, Matthew. Sure. Um, you know, there are, uh, uh, returning to, to where we started uh, at the top of the hour, uh, there are a lot of people uh, in the Demo on the democratic side uh, and uh, I would say probably the elites of the party in particular are pretty aggressively secular, uh, whereas the rank and file, it's different, you know. Sure. Uh, but Democrats have generally, uh, Democratic politicians, leading Democratic politicians, haven't invoked religion as much, certainly as Republican politicians have. Um, do you think, uh, uh, you know, it would, the, the Democrats should do that more? Um, well, I have a two-part answer to that um, because I'm, I have some ambivalence, ambivalences about, you know, um, at least in response to the way you framed the question. 
Yeah. Um, I would say in general, one reason I'd be, when I first started writing about kind of the religious left, I wrote a piece for dissent uh, not long after the 2016 election. And one of my concerns was that the Democratic Party, um, if I can put it this way, it's neoliberal turn over the past few decades. That's, that's also a style of politics that tends to be drained of moral urgency and kind of the language, moral language. And I don't think it's a surprise that say when Bernie Sanders ran in 2016 and he spoke the language of greed, um, you know, um, really kind of using strong morally condemnatory language to talk about say the way our economy functions. Um, I think that resonated for a reason. So, so I think in general, um, I think the Democratic Party could learn to speak the language of morality better to speak to the, the, the moral concerns driving their policies to be a slightly less technocratic rhetorically uh, party. Um, and I think religion can be one part of that. But my qualification, which would be the second part of my answer is you can't fake it. Um, and I would never, if a, if a candidate or politician is not religious, I would rather them speak in the language that they are most comfortable with. And I think the reason, uh, one argument I made in my, my uh, essay in the May issue is that I do think one reason Biden's Catholicism resonated in interesting ways is because he was in fact um, a deeply Catholic man whose faith had guided him through uh, numerous tragedies in his life. And uh, the line that Biden became kind of mourner in chief or that he, his, own, uh, his own grief met some moment in our public life when we were mourning the loss of hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens for the pandemic um, I think it, it worked because it was real for Biden. It was not something he tacked on for political advantage. When um, the, I, I point out that the priest um, who gave the opening prayer at Biden's inauguration also said the funeral mass for Bo Biden in 2015. Um, so this was not, uh, you know, uh, kind of a poll tested, uh, um, advisor driven, you have to start talking Catholic more. Uh, it wasn't that, it was real. So I would say religion, I think, can be an important part of a sort of moral re-energizing of the Democratic Party. But I, no one should fake it. And uh, if it's real, and that's how you talk about what you care about and what you think is right and wrong, you know, bring that with you into public life. But I, I, I don't, I just don't think you can fake um, uh, authentic religious commitments that really inform what you want to do politically, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of just kind of adopting that to say, hey, we need to close the God gap or whatever. Right. Andre, <laughs> well, what, what are your thoughts on, on the God gap? Is, is, that, uh, is that a problem for Democrats or, or, or is Matthew basically right that they shouldn't push that if it's not, if it doesn't come naturally to them? Well, I think that there is a God gap. Um, and I think that there is a challenge uh, within the Democratic Party. I completely agree with Matthew that if somebody is not, um, you know, is, is you know is is not fluent in in sort of the language of faith, doesn't have those types of personal experiences, um, it doesn't help when you try to project that. I mean, all you have to do is think about Donald Trump and like the two Corinthians moment and other gas that he made that really did betray. Um, you know, the fact that he, he wasn't a Christian, wasn't familiar even with various aspects of Christian culture to know what it was like. But people chose to ignore that because it led to a particular strategic end. And so, um, you know, a challenge that, you know, I've certainly had with, uh, you know, um, evangelical friends uh, with respect to the Democratic Party is, well, what are the stands kind of on social issues, particularly with respect to abortion? Could the tent be bigger on the Democratic side if they were more welcoming to pro-life uh, individuals and pro-life candidates? I think that that, you know, is an open discussion, but that is a reflection of the type of ideological sorting that we've seen happen um, within both parties in the last 50 years. And so as the liberals have all flocked to the Democratic Party mostly, and as the conservatives have basically flocked to the Republican Party, there isn't a middle ground. There isn't a place for people to be uh, to be bridge builders in that particular respect. Um, and as long as we're kind of there, it's probably going to be really hard to do those things that you know could attract some uh, you know uh, you know some people who you know might be identified as independent into the into the Democratic Party if their sticking point you know happens to deal with issues related to to life, for instance. 
Um, you know, but the other thing that's also really important to kind of keep in mind is that the heterogeneity that we talk about within the Democratic Party. Um, you know, we have to acknowledge that that ideological diversity is actually being driven by people of color. So there are many more conservative identified people of color who are still ide identifying as Democrats today because of the Republican Party's missteps with respect to race. So, you know, whether it was screwing up, uh, you know, in the aughts with respect to immigration and then doubling down on it more recently and then amplifying it with the rhetoric of Donald Trump. That notion of racism is what keeps some conservative leaning uh, people of color, particularly African Americans, out of the Republican Party. Um, and despite you know you know what uh, Edison Matowski may have said about you know blacks, black men in particular, but it was also black women, uh, you know, voting increasingly Republican in the 2020 cycle, blacks are still the most democratic voting bloc in the United States. That's both men and women. And that hasn't changed, it didn't change. And we don't see that changing for any you know, foreseeable future. If the Republican party had this about face about race, if it purged the racist elements of its party out, we might see race becoming less salient and we might see people using uh, you know, their faith commitments, uh, their social views to then determine, uh, you know, which party they would want to be in. And then that would be a really different ballgame. And I would, uh, you know, be arguing so that we should be talking about realignments in that moment. So those things are going to come forward. I think, you know, probably one big test that's going to be really interesting is looking at uh, the heterogeneity that we're seeing come out in the Democratic Party of reform policy, especially this week. Uh, with uh, the fighting between um, Israel um, and Hamas um, in Gaza. So, uh, you know, the idea that progressives are pushing for a harder line against Israel is something that could activate some evangelicals who have previously kind of made their peace with the Democratic Party, um, who, you know, have been reluctant to join the Republican Party because they think that everything that's going on there is insane. And so it's something that I'm definitely going to be paying attention to. Um, you know, in survey data where my colleagues and I have looked at this, trying to see whether or not Israel has anything, like we didn't see that having any difference at all. I do wonder if we were to pull that question again, whether or not we would start to see some, some different responses and whether or not that could actually be a significant predictor of certain types of back-end policy preferences, but we'll have to wait and see. Pete, uh, I'm very interested in your take on the God gap question from, from the conservative side. Uh, it's been my impression, which I'm sure you're going to tell me is wrong, that like during campaign times, you you conservatives must sit around and joke about how bad the Democrats are at talking about religion and 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 yoking their principles and values uh, uh, to religious principles, uh, and and you must sit around and say, God, thank thank goodness these people are so bad at this. Um, <laughs> is, is that anywhere near reality or? Well, I haven't been part of those conversations, but that doesn't mean that they that they haven't they haven't gone uh, gone on. No, I think that's that's right. I mean, there's no question, as was stated, the Democratic Party is a more secular party. It's not a secular party, but it certainly drifted that um, that way. And the Republican Party is m more of, of 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 a so quote unquote God party, at least in in language and and um, and rhetoric. And um, you know, I. I mean, I, it, it can be a problem for Democrats and it can be a problem for Republicans. I, I, I don't think it's really a per se answer. It really depends on what you do with faith. Um, yeah. My own, I speak here as a person of the Christian, Christian faith. I mean, I think, let me just to get more personal, what, what has been the most painful thing to me over the last five years um, has been the discrediting of the Christian witness in my, in my view um, at the altar of politics, because I care about faith and politics, my faith is more important than my politics, and to see it discredited and 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 you know uh, and damaged the way that it has is, has has been difficult. I do think that faith with people, as as Matthew was saying, and this has to be authentic. I'm I'm not in favor of these these um, you know faux. Uh, conversions every four years, or people invoking religious language, and they don't when they don't believe it. And I do think you can you can sense that. But look, I think faith properly understood um, can be an agent of healing and grace and reconciliation. And of course, faith has been a been been a, a, a an engine of social reform in American history as well as a, a as 
you know, a, a source of, of division as we're, as we're seeing today, it's, it's a mixed bag. I would say that it depends on whether people can um, interpret it right. But there's no question, even if you go through the history, you know, American history, I mean, Lincoln was, was, the, was the master at having used faith in a way that I think was, was, uh, um, was good for the country and spoke to, to his own beliefs, which were, which, were, which were complicated. I will say that if you go back and, and read the National Cathedral speech that George W. Bush gave on the Friday after the attacks on mm -hmm. September 11th, I think that's a beautiful speech that uses faith but I think uses it in a way that was unifying and actually help people through grief. Um, and one other point, and I wanted just to piggyback on what Matthew said, I quite agree with him. I'm not Catholic and I don't, I'm not gonna get into it at this point, we can later, whether what policy positions, particularly on, on the issue of life and abortion that a Catholic believes. Just as my observation of Joe Biden is that there is no question in my mind of how formative his Catholic belief is to his life experience. And I do think that in, in the comportment of, uh, of Biden since he's been president through, and really even before, that was there because the faith is what sustained him through terrible grief and terrible loss. And I think it made him a more empathetic person. Um, at a time when the country really needed that. I think that is a generally a quality that's important to have in a president, but there are moments in the life of a nation when that's particularly important. Um, and I think for Joe Biden, he, he, uh, I, th I think it would be almost impossible to pr pry apart Joe Biden from his understanding of what it means to be a Catholic. I think that they've melded together. In my mind, it's melded together in terms of his outlook and shaped who he is as a person in, in a good way, even though I disagree with him on, on some of his policy choices. And I understand why Catholics, um, particularly ones who were strongly pro-life, um, would, would, would take issue with him. We have 13 minutes to go. Uh, I'm scrolling through some of the questions we're receiving here. And uh, it's fair to say that the majority of these questions are about abortion in one way or another. So rather than ask any of these specific questions, but thanking all the people for submitting them. Uh, I, it seems like the audience would be interested in just hearing each of you uh, in the order I guess we've been going, Matthew, Andra, and Pete, uh, talk about abortion and, um, and its effect on how religion plays in American politics. Uh, I don't know. I have some specific questions in mind, but I'd rather just leave it open-ended and, and then maybe I'll hit you with follow-up questions. Uh, but it's obviously like one of the, if not the central issue here. Matt? Uh, well, a nice, not controversial topic to <laughs> close things out with. Uh, uh, I mean, to, to connect maybe the abortion issue to some of what we had discussed previously, um, you know, I think there probably is a way in which Democrats could do better at saying um, uh, our policies actually will make it much easier to bring life into the world uh, if you're a pregnant woman, right? Uh, if you're if you're uh, right, if you if if you're someone who's pregnant and you don't know if you'll have your job waiting for you when you get back, if you don't have maternity leave, um, if you don't have adequate health insurance, there are all these you know, issues kind of that uh, go beyond simply the legality of abortion or not, that I think Democrats uh, are much better on. Their policies are actually more pro-life in some ways. And I do wonder if they could speak to that, um, you know, when, uh, when it seems uh, relevant, right? Uh, maybe, you know, when you're campaigning in certain parts of the country or doing religious outreach, you know, I think it's, uh, they could speak to that maybe uh, a bit better. But um, it's also, you know, part of the problem is that, um, you know, the, the U.S. bishops have said that abortion is the preeminent issue politically today, yeah. meaning, and, uh, you know, that to me is really kind of putting your thumb on the scale and telling Catholic voters that, like, everything else pales in comparison to that, which is bad Catholic doctrine. It's bad theology, um, you know, no less than Pope Benedict himself when he was uh, Cardinal Ratzinger said that, you know, you are not obliged to, essentially, this is my condensation, this isn't theological language, but you're not obliged to vote for a madman because he's pro-life, right? There are proportional reasons to vote for um, a pro-choice candidate, even if you're a totally orthodox Catholic. And, um, you know, I think if there was ever someone to vote against, despite maybe having a problem with 
Biden's position on abortion, it would have been Trump. Um, I'll just stop there and let let other people pick up. Um, so, you know, this is a complicated issue and it manifests itself differently in different communities. And so I think in particular, since we are basically focusing on evangelicals and Catholics, um, what this looks like in say, uh, black evangelical communities or evangelical communities of color versus white evangelical communities is different. And so this might be a single issue type of uh, thing that motivates white evangelicals to vote. And there's certainly been a lot of social movement organization um, around that and framing this issue was basically being existential um, and trying to, uh, you know, avert God's judgment on, on, on America for having killed so many um, unborn children. Um, and for um, African Americans, overall African Americans are slightly more likely to be pro-life, uh, pro-choice, excuse me, um, than, um, than whites are. But, you know, we know that there are, you know, a significant portion of African Americans who don't believe in abortion. Um, that this isn't the issue that's motivating or is going to drive their vote. So issues related to race and racism, economic issues are going to be the thing that's going to be most salient for them because that affects their lives on a daily basis um, in ways uh, you know that an unplanned pregnancy might not. Um, and so I think it's sort of looking at that issue in terms of, of proportion. I mean, I think that there are larger discussions and debates that do, in fact, emanate from this. Like, you know, do we talk about contraception? Do we talk about comprehensive sex education, right? These also touch on some of the moral issues that I think are animating single issue voters uh, within white Christian communities in particular about these issues and sort of this idea that America has become more morally permissive. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and there are people who kind of want to stem the tide about that, but we have to have those discussions in addition to having the discussions that I think Matthew rightfully points out about what does a culture of life look like from conception to the grave um, and whether or not it's consistent to want to save the unborn's life but then not provide good education, quality housing, clean water, other things um, for people along their lives, making sure that they're treated equally throughout their life course and that they have an equal chance of being able to um, achieve their dreams and work hard. Um, I think you know that a lot of that has gotten lost in a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the debate, but we see it playing out differently in different types of communities. And so, yeah, there are plenty of, 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 of Blacks who are pro-life, uh, but that's not what's driving their vote. And they've made different choices in part because their life experiences have been different. And so they don't have the luxury of being able to be a single issue voter on that particular issue when there are other things that are um, more pressing. And so, you know, I think it's really important for us to be able to have that discussion and that might perhaps open up these larger discussions. So when you wanna talk about reproductive justice, the entry point for me um, as a black woman is knowing what care and treatment looks like for uh, black people when they go to the hospital to give birth and where more, uh, you know, maternal mortality rates are higher in black communities where infant mortality rates are higher, right? These all go back to uh, practices, structures, some interpersonal, but a lot institutional um, that end up having this really negative effect on black lives. Uh, and we've got to be able to address those issues as well. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to, to jump in. I'd say several things about the, the issue of abortion. Um, one is, is, as we know from public opinion polling, um, most Americans want it legal and most Americans uh, want a lot fewer abortions. Um, and it's, it's a very complicated um, topic. Um, I, I th in my estimation, one of the best articulations of, of, of abortion was actually from a former writer for, for, for the, uh, the New Republic, Charles Krauthammer. He wrote this a long time ago, it was actually in 1985. And he said, there's not the slightest recognition on either side that abortion might be at the limits of our empirical and moral knowledge. The problem starts with an awesome mystery, the transformation of two soulless cells into a living human being. That leads to an insoluble empirical question. How and exactly when does that occur? And on that in turn hangs the moral issue. What are the claims of the entity undergoing the transformation? How can we expect such a question to yield answers that are not tentative and indeterminate? So difficult and moral questions should command humility or at least a little old fashioned tolerance. And I remember when I read that at the time, and I still think that that captured a kind of spirit that we ought to have more in this debate. Um, of all my faults with the evangelical community, and I have a number of them as I've expressed here, their stand on pro-life is not one of them. Uh, even I th think 
people who can disagree. I think these are good faith arguments and they start from a premise which is not an unreasonable premise. They think that, 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 that what's happening is the destruction of a human being. And that's, that's a very complicated question, which is where on the spectrum does that begin? You know, you're talking about moments after conception versus, you know, late stage abortion. And um, so uh, I think both sides need to understand that these are reasonable premises and real struggles that people have. The last thing I'll say about it, Michael, I don't think this actually gets enough attention, oddly enough. I, I wrote a column in the Times about this a couple of years ago, and that is the fact that the number of abortions today uh, are at the low, are lower now than they were pre Roe v. Wade. And if you look at the number of abortions in America, the absolute number, the rate and the ratio, really depending on when you start, because you can measure these things different ways, but it was either the high water mark was either in the eighties or I think in the absolute number like 1991, 92, uh, about 1.8, 1.7 million abortions. We now have, I think around 600,000 more or less. And it's gone almost straight down for the last several decades. If you look at the data, it actually goes down, the number of abortions go down more under Democratic presidents than Republican presidents, but they've gone down under both. Mm -hmm. And the point is that culture and life is complicated and you just can't make a direct, easy, connect the dots link between even Supreme Court nominees or presidential candidates and, and abortion. And it is interesting to me that if you raise this issue with some people, not all, but some people on the right, and not just on abortion, but on others uh, where you've seen cultural progress, the interesting thing is you don't hear any degree of, of, of joy or celebration at the progress. Because I do think that for some people on the right, there is, they're wed to a kind of dark narrative about the shape of the country. And so if there is, even evidence that counteracts things in a way that they would think was positive and affirming, that it doesn't seem to penetrate it because they have a certain narrative in, in, in mind. So I, for one, am glad that the number of abortions have gone down and I hope they continue to go, um, go down. Um, but people who are pro-life should, should probably celebrate that fact a little, little more as well. I want to go around the horn with a last question, but Pete, I want to stick with you for a second because I have this question that I'm very interested in how you would answer it if you can do so quickly. Okay. Uh, it's a, a lot of people I talk to think that if the Supreme Court overturns Roe and the religious right has won that, a lot of people on the right will just kind of get out of politics because you won. Is that going to happen in your view? Uh, it might happen some. I don't think it's going to happen uh, across the board because I, yeah. I don't think that the thing that's energizing the right in politics is simply or even primarily abortion. That's an issue that that people uh, hold to and a lot of people care about it. It's a broader cultural phenomenon. Um, and um, I think that the right's going to stay uh, engaged in, yeah. in, in I don't even think it animates people like it did in the, in the past. That's really interesting. Uh, okay, it's 7.58, gang. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you um, uh, for doing this. It's been a great conversation. Let's, uh, let me put one last question out there that obviously you're all going to have to address pretty quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, is there anything about the views of religious conservatives and religious liberals in this country that is reconcilable? Matthew. Um, you mean uh, places where like agreement could be found, common yeah, ground of some or, kind, yeah, or yeah, yeah, places where agreement could be found, places uh, you know, uh, is this is this not destined to help tear the country apart? Uh, well, I hope not, <laughs> and uh, you know, I don't know, but I, I will say that um, I, I would hope that you know the the, the Christian commands to. Uh, to feed the naked, or to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, give water to those who are thirsty, to visit the prisoner, you know, care of the widow. Those are pretty clear. And I would hope that um, in general, religious people, Christians, at least, you know, different uh, political convictions coming from different places could possibly, you know, uh, really find common ground over the very explicit commands of Jesus Christ to treat the least among us better than our country does. Fair enough. Andra. So right now, I'm not optimistic that our fever of, of polarization and division has broken. 
Um, but I'm optimistic that it could get there. It's certainly um, something that I, I will pray for. Um, and I think that there's some concrete steps that need to be taken, but I would actually turn to the heart. Um, and part of the problem is naked pursuit of power and one upsmanship at all costs. I don't see a lot of humility. I don't see um, repentance. I don't see people being willing to confess their sins. Um, you know, that's part of the problem with Republican opposition to the January 6th commission is, is, is that Republicans don't want to look bad in an election year. And they don't want to admit that the folks on their side were wrong on this, even if it wasn't them personally, uh, because there's a short term loss that could be gained from that. And as um, you know, the Bible says uh, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Um, and so um, until people learn that, um, I think that we're probably going to be at an impasse, but I think that there is an opportunity for us to be able to get to that point. And I think the best thing that we can do as citizens um, is to look at our, our candidates for office, you know, from dog uh, catcher to, you know, Senate um, and governor, um, and we should stop, you know, start voting out the people who are the problems voting out the people who are so proud that they are just going to stir the pot and make trouble um, and self aggrandize as actually opposed to doing what we you know hired them to do uh, when we sent them to whatever office it was we were electing them to that's tough because we all seem to be wedded to our team but we're going to have to get over some of that in order to put the right people in position who are going to be able to make the real difference thank you right here oh dear pete's frozen on us uh, well, uh, uh, Dr. Gillespie, I'll pray with you, but we might be waiting a while for that. <laughs> That's it. Let patients have his perfect work. So I've, I've had to wait and pray for a lot of things. So this is just one of them. Oh, Pete Winter's connection looks like something has happened. Oh. Yeah. Oh, dear. Uh, I wanted to hear what he had to say about that. But here we are, folks. Thank you, Andra. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Thank you everyone who attended. We really appreciate you. Oh, Pete's back. Okay. Give us 40 seconds on, on, on the last sure. question. Yeah, sorry. I got, um, in the short term, I don't think that, that uh, we will be able to, uh, to, to find agreement because I don't think in our current political context um, that's possible. Um, I do think that in the longer term, what, what really matters is, is the effect that faith has on people's heart. I think if, if people of the Christian faith use Jesus as a model and their hearts become more tender, um, and more humble and more forgiving of one another. And I mean that on the, on, the, on the religious left and the religious right. I think a lot of good can be, can be done. I think faith properly understood. And if people's um, lives are transformed and hearts are transformed, it can be an instrument of grace and repair and reconciliation. And that's what the country needs right now. And I think that, uh, that, that faith could offer that. Um, and, and I hope it does. We need it. Let us hope. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks to our panelists and thanks Thank to you. all of you who watched. Please visit TNR.com and we'll see you next time.